sorry, Dr. Duffy is SVP of Clinical Operations. And we have Ms. Ta Tanya Witt, Chief Clinical Officer of Everyone Here is for Mind Care. Let's welcome them. So we're very excited to discuss a topic that I'm sure many of you have heard about, um, and that's how genetic testing can uh, optimize psychotropic medication management. Here's our disclosures. All right, today we're gonna review the fundamentals of pharmacogenomics, uh, analyze the benefits of using psychiatric genetic testing, and understand the, when you should, the clinical of using psychotropic um, genetic testing and review the ethical and clinical considerations regarding using such tests. All right, so first we're gonna start about, uh, start talking about the fundamentals of pharmacogenomics. Um, and I, I also like this, this quote here says, genes are not about inevitabilities, they're about potentials and vulnerabilities. So over the next few slides, we're gonna show some names of different genes, Nobody here owns a cat. A cat didn't walk across the keyboard. They're meant to be that way. They look weird just because genes are named weird. Here's your Hello. Hello. Alright, so pharmacogenomics, also known as pharmacogenetics. Um, it examines how the genes influence drug responses, combining pharmacology and genomics. And it creates effective, safe medications that are tailored to a individual's genetic profile. This field is especially relevant for psychotropic and other medications because it's aiming to replace that one-size-fits-all approach to personalized medicine. Adverse drug reactions are a major cause of hospitalization and deaths in the U.S. and highlights the importance of this personalized approach to medication management. Pharmacodynamic studies um, how drugs affect the body by interacting with receptors, ion channels, enzymes, everything, okay? It describes what a drug does to the body. Pharmacokinetics focuses on what the body does to the drug. So they're, both are there, they do two different things. Understanding these aspects is crucial for that personalized medicine and allows the treatments to be tailored to that person's genetic makeup and their specific physiological responses, which enhances the efficacy and their safety. So I'm not going into great big detail on all of these. <laughs> we only have an hour. So, um, but these, for the ph pharmacodynamic genes, these are the genes that are your pharmacodynamic genes, okay? Um, so when we're looking at them, uh, the one that I will point out is the HR, HTR2A. That's a serotonin receptor uh, type 2A. And the function is that it encodes serotonin and it's responsible for serotonin signaling. Serotonin is really big for our patients who have depression and anxiety. These are your pharmacokinetic genes. Again, I'm not gonna go into great big detail on all of these, um, but I will highlight the one, which is your um, CYP, CYP3A4. The function of this is to metabolize over 50% of the medicines in our body. And the impact is that um, the inhibition, so there's inhibitors, so there's medications that inhibit this gene. Some of them can be antibiotics, like erythromycin, erythromycin. Um, some of them are normal meds that we give our patients to tell us them, right? It's heart drug. Some of these medications are just there. So if we have a patient taking that, it can in inhibit this gene. Um, and the result can um, cause a drug toxicity, um, and um, that's for the inhibition, and then the induction can cause a reduced plasma concentration and efficacy. So it's important to know that because we don't want to just keep adding medications if it's not going to work, or adding dose. Okay, so when we're looking at um, some sample genetic responses, there are a lot of different types of testing. Um, how they and how they interpret these test results vary. 
This is an example of some of the responses for different types of um, testing. So one can be, uh, the result could be that the serum level may be too high, which would indicate we need to have lower doses. Um, serum level might be too low, which means higher doses would be required. When you're looking at that, these considerations reflect an issue on how the medication is metabolized in that individual. And it may affect how much the medication um, is in the individual system. Uh, difficult to predict a dose response or dose adjustment due to conflicting variations in metabolism. We do see that sometimes um, on the result from these tests. Um, there's a genotype may impact drug me mechanism of action and result in reduced efficacy. That's obviously important because we don't want to give a patient a drug that has reduced efficacy. Use of this drug may increase risk of side effects. That's a big one. I don't want to give my patients a drug that's going to have side effects that are, you know, have an increased risk of having the side effects. Um, smoking status, you know, some patients still smoke, so if they're smoking, that can impact the results of that medication. And then FDA label identifies the potential, potential gene-drug interaction for this medication. Um, this does indicate the FDA has made a statement in the medication's packaging um, that the pharmacogenomic implications for the patient. So the FDA does have inserts in packaging that talks about pharmacogenetics and its importance. Uh, per FDA label, this medication is contradicted, contradict, contraindicated for this genotype. So it's saying for this genotype, they should not take this medication. And then this medication does not have identified or clinically proven genetic markers which allow it to be categorized. So we're not currently able to categorize that's just some results, yeah. I was just going to clarify, um, um, the way that the genetic responses are um, sent out as part of the company that's doing it can vary. Um, this is a sample from a uh, genetic company that only looks at psychotropic medications and how they report um, some of the findings. There's other companies that do a little bit more um, digging into uh, all medications and, and all um, aspects of that and report it a little bit differently. So, um, but the underlying themes of how they can be impacted are the same. Um, the reporting just looks a little bit different. Okay, so common medications that um, have clinical practice guidelines. So this slide um, just provides specific examples of how different genotypes influence dosing um, of several common medications. Um, the one I do, you know, like, I mean, you can see there's common ones on there. So it's a telegram that's common. That's an antidepressant. Um, you might see that a lot, duloxetine, another common antidepressant utilized. But when you're looking at these, you know, like Abilify, that's an antipsychotic. If we just start right with just that one, it's commonly used to treat psychiatric conditions. So when you have patients that are identified as poor metabolizers of one of those genes that we had up there, it's recommended that the initial dose of Abilify be reduced by 50% of the usual dose. So if I just walked in and I gave them the regular starting dose, it's not going to be good for them. So knowing that and, and utilizing that report to individualize my care for that patient results in better outcomes for the patient. And again, these are all guidelines in those FDA packaging inserts. Does it, does it require that the No, it's not required. It should be, it should happen, yeah. but it's not required. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about that yeah. later. <laughs> so, and on this screen, again, this has your clinical practice guidelines in the insert. I mean, look how many are on there. And these are just psychotropics. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, not looking at any medications we would use to treat, um, you know, somatic disorders. All of these psychotropic medications have um, guidelines in the clinical practice um, FDA package inserts. Yeah. And so, I mean, 